Uh, I'm George Sachs, clinical psychologist and ADD specialist. And I have the pleasure today to bring you Caroline McGuire. Uh, hello, Caroline, how are you? I'm great, thank you for having me. Caroline has a master's in education and she's a professional certified coach uh, who works with adults who struggle, struggle socially. Um, she is the fat, which is a common trait in uh, adult ADD. She's the founder of a new training curriculum at the ADD Coaching Academy, the only coach training program accredited by the International Coach Federation. Uh, and her revolutionary coaching program helps teach executive functioning skills to young adults. And she was the former coach for the Hallowell Center in uh, Sudbury, Massachusetts. Uh, most importantly, her groundbreaking book, Why Will No One Play With Me, is the number one new release on Amazon. So that's very exciting, Caroline. Thank you so much. There's a lot of uh, people who are needing this book, and um, the next book will be um, exclusively for adults. And um, it really, it's just it's something that in the ADD community we don't talk about as much as we should, which is social skills. Right, I, I, I do think that's a big problem. Um, and I wonder in my, myself if this is genetic or if this is part of you know, some of the symptoms growing up as a child with ADD, um, minimize the opportunity for socialization. If you're hyperactive or spacey, it's harder to connect. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, how the, the problems develop? Well, I think there's multiple sources. So one, you know, the executive function, the hub of the brain, um, that control um, our self-regulation, our attention, our emotional regulation, that also drives social skills. So that definitely those ADHD challenges come from the brain-based challenges, and that's one reason. I also think, yes, um, many of the time when kids are young, their struggles with the ADHD challenges, often that have gone undetected, drive sort of this this lack of social opportunity or a real self-consciousness because you know we make mistakes and then we sort of fester about those mistakes and ruminate and then we can make more mistakes um and then the other thing is i think that there are some traits that we have as ADD years that are a little bit um that, you know that can affect social like we really want intimacy fast so we say too much because we really don't want to have um, an acquaintance level relationship, or we don't filter. You know, we do things that sort of- let, um, let, me, let me jump in here for a second. That's really but, interesting. Um, I haven't heard that specifically toward, I, I see it a lot in my clients, but what do you think is behind that? That the acquaintance level relationship is not satisfactory? I think some of it is this, this um, lack of filter, right? So we don't filter, we kind of just blurt. Um, I also think it's that we tend to um, have this trait where we want people to be really authentic and we want to sort of, you know, jump right in. Um, and that means that we are trying to turn acquaintances into real friends or to tell them too much. Um, if you go to, you know, an ADD conference, it's totally accepted and it's just so much fun. But in the real world, it's hard. I also see this with uh, romantic relationships where one, the ADD partner really wants to speed things up or they're, you know, they're already imagining the wedding and things like that on the first date. Yeah. Uh, that may be common in a lot of different groups, but I see that particularly with um, my ADD clients. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it goes back to like self-regulation, right? We're rushing right ahead and, um, and not having that pause button. So, um, I definitely see that a lot as well. I see it in my adult clients, my young adult clients, um, and um, it, it, it causes problems because other people kind of don't understand. Uh, what's it really interesting is that I just had this conversation with a, a female client with ADD um, two days ago where she's uh, in a very new relationship and she's already feeling anxious about the possibilities because she likes the guy. So what we did is we actually set up a timetable, um, you know, so to slow her down and give her kind of a framework. So for example, um, we planned out three months when she would introduce him, if things all went well and she actually liked him, but 
she would introduce him to her friends. And then six months, and we planned it on the calendar, she, she might introduce him to her family. Uh, this gave her a sense of relief because she you know, was like, when am I gonna do this? When is this gonna happen? Right. So, um, so I, I'm really happy you, you mentioned that. And um, I hope people um, you know, resonate with that idea that there's a kind of rushing into relationship. Yeah, and I also think just to, you know about your client and, and social skills, I think because a lot of our parents are ADD, right? It's genetic. Yeah. Um, we don't have that sense of what is typical around social skills, right? So everybody wants to be unique. Everyone wants to be their own self. And I'm not in any way saying we shouldn't be. But there are sort of typical norms in society. And for social, whether it's, you know, how long before you have someone meet your parents or how much do you divulge, you know, when you just first meet someone, I think that is a key piece is to have those kind of conversations like you had with your client and look at what are the norms and where do I want to make a choice, right? You know, kind of like, where do I hold them and where do I fold them, right? Where do I make a choice to say, I'm going to be different or where do we, you know, just rush in and then we regret it? Yes, exactly. So uh, rushing into relationship and, and not being satisfied with the kind of acquaintance stage is a big problem. What other problems do you see in your clients? Um, monologuing and blurting it is a huge, huge thing. And then sort of that regret, that sort of, you know, regret hangover that happens where people say, you know, I went on this, you know, day long, you know, thing with my boss and, and these colleagues and I've monologued and I blurted too much and now I have just like so much regret. So I think though those kind of behaviors that are also self-regulation um, and not listening, right? We, we do a lot and then we have so much um, regret and self-loathing. Yeah, the shame about how we show up in the world is really, um, painful and micro analyzing every single interaction afterwards because inevitably there's some something said that's inappropriate or not timed well etc right 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 and it's all self-regulation so i always say to people we can't work on you know everything or you you, you just nothing will happen so if all of the if a lot of this goes back to self-regulation then we want to set the mission and really try to focus on working on that self-regulation piece. Um, and also that way you can give yourself a little bit of a break, right? Because you can look at the whole that you did better versus that one thing that you didn't do well. And I bet of your colleagues, someone else didn't do everything, you know, the way they wanted to, but we beat ourselves up because we have this history. And what do you recommend for, um, for ADD adults with that kind of impulsivity or, 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 or blurting potential. Um, do you have any tips for parties or, or dates or, or things like that? Yes. So there's a couple things. One is that um, uh, you literally, I, I know that the book is, is for up to young adults while no one play with me, but there are exercises in there to improve self-regulation. And they can, I use them with all age groups. So just ignore the visuals and you, you can use them. One of the things that has to happen is we have to become aware of our triggers. So what causes big responses and the, the, the environmental factors that affect us. So one of the things I always ask people to do is to kind of take an incident and let's look at the before, you know, were you hungry? Were you tired? Were you angry? Did something trigger you? And then also to have some kind of cue. So every time you enter a doorway or every time you, um, you know, get out of your car, that that is your cue to be aware and focus on trying to manage your emotions and your self-regulation. Self-regulation, as you know, is all about our levels of arousal and our levels of activity going up. And there are physical signs. So I always try to diagnose those with clients. Like, what are the signs that you're getting too hyped up and you're going to start sort of blurting or monologuing? And then the other thing is to practice. So to set the mission and say, I'm going to go to this event 
and I'm going to practice leaving space and it's going to feel uncomfortable, but I promise you no, no one will notice that one beat you wait before you jump in or before you respond. Um, and then also people love to talk about themselves. So try if you're a monologuer asking people questions and letting them talk and then you're the responder. I really like that idea of practicing and letting, um, you know, the, the, the anxiety of silence, practicing with the anxiety of silence. Because I think, you know, with adult ADD, there's kind of an insecurity in relationship. And mm -hmm. the idea that I have, if I'm silent, then they, they won't like me. Yeah. Uh, so there's a kind of um, a propensity to talk too much and blurt out. So, you know, just waiting and seeing what the reaction is and realizing that they're, um, there's no significant problem with a little bit of silence. Right, and also, you know, um, when you go back and forth, like you and I are, in a conversation, there's a natural pause where, you know, you finished and now I'm coming in. And in the, in the neurotypical world, people are not going to think about that. But because we're so self-conscious, we're thinking about it a lot. So the more you practice giving that space and really trying to listen instead of just jump in, the more it's going to feel natural to you. And I promise you, try it with a friend. Have somebody spy on you while you're at a party. The end of the party, they're going to say they noticed nothing weird about what you were doing. It's all our worry. Yeah, I, I call this a ping pong conversation with, with my clients. You know, the back and forth is really important. Um, I also like the idea of the cue you said. Uh, that, that follows from the book, uh, The Power of Habit, where you need a cue to remember the habit. And the idea of a doorway or whatever works for you, like the, every time this happens, I'm going to slow down and, you know, be more conscious of how I speak and show up. Absolutely. And I love the power of habit. You're absolutely right. That is where it came from. But it also came from my personal experience. You know, I have ADHD. I definitely was a person who was struggling with self-regulation until, you know, two minutes ago. And I still struggle sometimes. And I, I find that when I work with clients, you know, I try different experiments to see what we can do to help them. And one of the things that just always works is having that cue because it's a reminder. It's a big flag. Like you're entering your boss's office. There's a doorway, you know, breathe in and out and let's practice that space. Wonderful. So what other uh, skills, social skills do you find uh, people with ADD need struggle with? I find that people with ADD forget that when we're hungry, we're tired, we're overwhelmed, we still have to have a modicum of politeness and we still have to sometimes pretend we're interested, right? So interest is just such an emotional driver for us. And when we're not interested, obviously our brain reacts. So, um, you know, it's almost torturous for us to be in uninteresting situations but it's inevitable, right? Because not everything is going to be, you know, a, a carnival. And so one of the things I find is that lack of interest causes us almost to, you know, have self-regulation issues, to have a reaction, and also those physical symptoms. And then we kind of forget our manners and we're not polite or we're too abrupt or our tone gets to be not so nice. And you know, other people have feelings about that. They're like reacting to it. And then we again have this shame. So that's one of the other big things I find. Right, what, the shame or the, uh, the problems with interest? I, I like that, that the word push through came, came to mind when there's, you know, crankiness is a, is a big problem for adults with ADD. Yeah. And it's like, uh, we often don't outgrow it. Um, but I like that idea of just realizing, okay, I'm cranky, I'm not interested, let me push through and be appropriate in this situation. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I meant. You know, with little kids or younger ones, I call it a polite pretend. You know, like you have to pretend to be, be interested, 
you have to pretend right now but it's really true for all ages. I do it myself. I have to say to myself, like you have to pretend. Um, and also it goes back to those triggers, interest, you know, hunger, like you said, it all causes this crankiness and it makes a bad impression and people get annoyed and also don't understand us. So they don't understand that like, it's actually super hard for us to push through that crankiness. Well, it also, I mean, in a work setting, it could really affect your, your job or your ability to be promoted. Um, if you're, you know, unregulated, dysregulated and cranky. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you listen to, um, CEOs talking about what they want from people, they never want perfect social skills. You know, there have been studies done where they've, they've surveyed CEOs and they don't want perfect social skills. But what they do want is people to be able to adapt and also read the room. And so the crankiness to me is also part of that whole, like, sometimes you have to um, self-regulate and you have to do what is expected in order to make sure that you kind of fit in and you don't alienate people. Right, right. Well, uh, this has been really helpful, uh, and I can see you, you're, you're definitely knowledgeable on the subject and probably helped many people there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now, if you're, you have any new books in the, in the pipeline or seminars or workshops? Sure. Um, so I do, so the Why Will No One Play With Me just came out like a month ago. Um, I do have um, workshops that are going to start in the new year that are for um, webinars about social skills so people can come and they can watch at their leisure. Um, the other thing is that I am starting to work on the book for adults. Um, and one of the things I am doing is getting more information from the top sort of like 250 CEOs in America, partly so we can know what is needed and and that way we can also throw out some of that shame right because there's a lot of things i hear from add adults and other adults that they believe they need to sort of navigate toward that maybe they don't maybe that's not what what's expected it's really more um you know our own baggage that causes us to feel that way so um i'm definitely if you go to caroline mcguire author.com um all the the webinars and materials that i'm that I'm putting out there are, are right there. Okay, well, um, thank you very much. And um, maybe we'll see you next year. Absolutely, thank you so much. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank you.